All right, we are going to pick up uh, with Revelation chapter 5, the second half today. You know, it's, it's funny this morning as I was looking through uh, my notes I'd taken from studying yesterday. And, um, I told Sarah this morning, I said, I don't know if we're going to have a real long study tonight. Because as I look at the commentaries, they're pretty, I don't want to say generalized, but they're kind of vague about the second half of chapter 5. They just kind of move on and, and they kind of gloss over it. But when I really started to crack into it today, get, get into the meat, I think this is one of the longer slideshows I have. Uh, and so to quote Jerry Reed, we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. So, <clears throat> um, and y'all pray for me. My daughter, Clara, I love her. She has gotten on a Smokey and the Bandit kick. And you know that child, once she latches on to something, she just doesn't let go. I have listened to Jerry Reed sing that song so many times it's coming out of my ears. <clears throat> but just as a review, we left off. Chapter or verse 7 of chapter 5 is kind of a, a transitional verse between the first half, the first six verses, and then uh, the second half uh, with the, the seven verses that follow. We see the lamb that looks as if he's been slain. He takes the scroll. We talked about how he alone, out of all of creation, he alone was the one who was worthy. And it must be open, right? It's part of God's plans. His plans will always be completed. So as terrible as it may seem for us, and as hard as it is for us to understand, it is God's plan for the rest of human history. And so it must be carried out. Only Jesus was worthy to open the scroll. <clears throat> and then we had this quote that came out of uh, the Wesley Bible Commentary. Remember, we're talking a lot about these things having symbolic meanings. And, and John trying to explain what he is seeing to people that have no frame of reference. Symbols are both descriptions of experienced realities and statements of belief about their meaning. They are suggestive, not dogmatic, meaning they're not exact, and you have to believe it's exactly like this. Indeed, they contain within themselves an acknowledgement that they do not presume to make a full description. So as John is writing this, he's saying to the people who are reading it, Look, folks, I know that you don't understand everything I'm writing to you, but I'm doing the best I can to explain the unexplainable. Like, I, I'm giving you a little pinhole view of the whole picture, but bear with me. It's kind of like this. This is as close as we can get. Uh, <clears throat> it would be like trying to explain the internal combustion engine to me. <laughs> I, I know nothing about mechanics, okay? It would be like Bob trying to explain how to work on a computer. <laughs> You might as well forget it. Bob's a wizard as far as I'm concerned. He does magic. That's what he does. I'm not ready for that. I can't explain quantum physics to Michael. He's, he's going to be seven. It's not something he can understand. But I can give him the basics of math, and he can kind of pick up on that, right? John has kind of given us the basics, the Lego blocks of what he's seen. <clears throat> so let's jump in here at verse, uh, all right, verse 8. So this is chapter 5, verse 8, and I'm going to pick up reading here, and I'm going to read down through verse 10. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. All right, we're going to pause right there. So as I was reading this, the words fell down came to mind. Now, you may have seen my post earlier on Facebook and kind of spoiled the surprise, but I was so excited when I read this, I couldn't, I couldn't stand it, and I had to share it. So if you read it, just follow along. The word for fell, I thought, that's an interesting word. I, I, we read about people falling down. Before God, what does it mean? Is it just like they pass out? Like you've seen people, they're slain in the spirit and they'll just pass out wherever they are, right? We see this in a lot more of our charismatic churches. People will kind of be slain in the spirit and they'll just pass out and they'll collapse. Or does it mean that they fell down with you know their heads on the ground? Or does it mean they blacked out? Or what what does it mean? So the word that John uses is pipto, which uh, when I looked at the back of my Greek Bible, it defined it as fall fall down, fall to one's ruin or destruction, fall to one's knees, bow of worship, be done away with, come to an end, die, strike, or to beat on, as in the heat of the sun, you know, it was beating down on someone. 
And as I read those words, I, I literally said out loud in my office, whoa. <laughs> I don't often re-go, whoa. That's a lot to unpack in that little word, pipto. And when I read it, it doesn't seem like all those things go together. But yet they, they do. <clears throat> because it says we fall down, we fall to one's ruin or destruction. We're, we, we're done away with, we come to an end. When we stand in the presence of God, anything sinful, we, we are just undone in the presence of almighty, infinite, all-powerful God. There's a reason why no humans have ever looked on the face of God. When, when God passed by Moses, he showed him his back. And just that encounter transformed Moses into something that people were terrified to look at him because the radiance of God was so great they couldn't look at him. They had to put a bag on his head. And that was God's back. To look on the face of God, we, we are undone in his presence. Our maker, he doesn't just see us. He sees each and every fiber, every molecule, every atom of our being. He sees that. We are completely undone in his presence. And we fall to our knees in worship. And, and the imagery here is, is prostrate. Okay, not prostate. That's different. <laughs> One letter makes a big difference. Okay, prostrate. Now, if you, if you grew up in the Catholic tradition, uh, you, you may have seen the priest lie on the floor in the front of the church with his arms out and his head on the floor. He's lying prostrate. More, I think, in this context would be more of what you see in the Islamic traditions, where five times a day they will kneel and place their head on the ground in front of them, acknowledging that they are nowhere near the level of their God, right? Now, we, again, we're very reserved, and I think we need to be a little less reserved in our worship. When we prostrate ourselves before the Lord, we put our head on the ground, and we say, Lord, I, I am dirt. <laughs> If you choose to use this dirt for something, that's all glory for you. But I am dirt. You are everything. I am nothing. I humble myself to the point of being the ground. I become nothing in my worship. When we come to an end, I love that definition. As Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. When I worship God, I am telling him, Lord, I, I am not worthy of worship. I am nothing. I end so that you can carry on. May my life be nothing so that you are magnified even more. And I find that so beautiful. It's like saying to the acorn, I need you to die so that you can become a mighty oak tree. Lord, take this nut and do something amazing. May I die so that you may receive glory and honor and praise. And our response is, it says to, you know, this, this, this last definition here, to beat on, like the heat of the sun. Have you ever walked outside and it's just oppressively hot? And it's just, oh my goodness, you can't hardly stand. Imagine that magnified. The presence of standing, I mean, the, 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 the radiance of standing in God's presence is such that we just, we can't even stand. We, we collapse. That's the natural response to the weight of his glory. And so that little word right there, they fell down. Wow. I mean, that hit me like a ton of bricks. And it challenged the way I have viewed worship. Not that I had a bad view before, but really I don't think my view of worship before went far enough. I need to completely end. No more. I die to myself. Take up my cross daily so that I can live in him. That's worship each and every day. And this is going on for eternity. Every moment of eternity exists for him. Little word, huge, huge importance. They fell down. Folks, I, 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 tell you, I got goosebumps. This was a goosebumps moment. When, when This is one of those things. I've done this study. Through, this would be the third time I've walked through Revelation in, in a context like this. I mean, I've read through it a bunch. But I love that every time I read through it, God just reveals stuff to me again and again, and I go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. It's wonderful. Oh, it's so wonderful. All right, I got to move on because we'll, we, I could spend all day on Pipto, and that's that's two words in. <laughs> all right. So when it says they fell down, that wasn't just a collapse. They fell down before the Lamb. 
right? He's at the center of the throne. God the Father is on the throne. Christ is at the center of the throne. The Spirit of God is proceeding from the throne right, into all the world. And they fall down before the Lamb. And I know I referenced this last time, but Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess or acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When Jesus took the scroll, everyone fell down and worshipped, and they glorified the Lamb, which then in turn brings glory to God the Father. He alone is worthy. He alone is worthy. And their hymn of praise reveals why. We're going to break into that hymn of praise here in just a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. And it said, this was the, the four living creatures and the 24 elders. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls of incense. All right. So they had a harp and a bowl. Now, this is kind of an odd combination, but you think about a harp and a bowl. Now, when we think of a harp, especially in the context of Scripture, our mind automatically goes to the, the lyre or the lyre, right? This is where the word lyrics come from. It's the music. Okay, this is what we think of. David's sitting and he's playing on his little harp, his little four-string thing. When you see in Greek mythology, you see, um, you see some of them, they're playing the harps, right? And it's this little four-string thing. That's what we think of. We think of the lyre. It's Greek in origin, but it's prominent in many ancient Near Eastern cultures. That's that culture because they were very Hellenistic. When you hear the term Hellenistic, it means they've been Greekified. Okay? Alexander the Great was Greek. He conquered most of the known world, which encompassed what we now call the Holy Lands. It encompassed... Uh, Italy had encompassed Greece. When the Romans took over, they fell in love with Greek culture, so they spread it. So this was not an uncommon thing. This is kind of like how you can go to China right now or uh, someplace in Africa and get a Coca-Cola and a Big Mac. Okay? American culture has permeated the whole world. Greek culture for them had permeated the whole world. Even though they were Romans, they were very Greek, if that makes any sense at all. So this idea that they had these harps in heaven was not... A far stretch for them. That would be like saying they, they had a praise team. Okay. But as I looked into this a little deeper, there are two kinds. And again, this, this is one of those things that just went this. Lord, you're just awesome. First is what we see here. Right? This is called the formix. It has four strings. That's what we always think of. There's another one, though, that's called the kathara, which has seven strings. Now, what does seven mean in Scripture? Perfect. It's perfect worship. It's perfect music. It's beautifully perfect praise in this moment for God. And here's the really cool thing. Bob, I thought about you at this moment. Uh, but Brian, not Nukes. I think about you a lot, too, but this one's, this one's for the other Bob. If you type in kithara in Greek, you get guitar. That's the modern Greek word for guitar is kithara. So maybe when we get to heaven, I ask AI, I, I typed in, guitars in heaven, and I was not disappointed. <laughs> this is an AI-generated image. But maybe around the throne, this is what it looks like, right? We got the steel guitar up there. We got the, you know, the dobro going. We got you know electric guitar. This is all-time, infinitely perfect worship. There is nothing that compares to the worship in heaven. What we do here is but a poor imitation of what is going on every day in heaven. Day in, day out. It is beautiful and it is wonderful and it is perfect. And so they're holding these seven stringed harps and they're playing this beautiful heavenly music. And then I took a look at the bowl. Now these are not regular bowls, they're golden bowls. Now that right there should tell us something about the importance of what's inside of it. All right, you know, I, I remember going through my grandma's house. And my grandma was born in 1939, and she had stuff from her parents that she'd kept for years and years. I mean, we had stuff in the house that was well over 100 years old. And some of the things were, you know, pots. And I found this one great big pot. Look, it was like a giant coffee pot. It had this handle on the side. I said, Grandma, what's this one? And she laughed. She said, that's a 
chamber pot. What's that? Okay. It wasn't golden, I can tell you. Right? It was as plain as it could be because it was utilitarian. Now, inside of her china cabinet, she had a solid crystal bowl, right? She got for her wedding. My dad still has that solid crystal bowl. It's beautiful, right? Why was it not in the chamber? Because it was meant to be special. The fact that these are golden bowls imply that whatever is inside of it is of great value and of great importance. You don't put ordinary things in expensive things. You save the expensive things for the expensive container. Right? We, we value what we invest the money into. Here, these are golden bowls. So what's inside of them is, is of the highest importance. They're full of incense, it says. Now, anybody burn incense in here? You, you hippies? Anybody? <laughs> right? That's kind of that's kind of something, right? A couple people, you know, we, we burn incense. I, I remember when I was in uh, high school, my Spanish teacher was from Mexico, and she brought in some pine resin that she burnt one time because it was something they were doing. I think it was like the Dia de los Muertes, the Day of the Dead. And, so it was kind of a cultural thing. And then she actually set off the smoke alarm during the standardized testing for the school. And, um, it was not a fun day for her. But that's culturally something that's important. And that's what incense is. It is, is resin from basically pine trees. It's kind of what incense is. But it was very valuable. Think about this. When Jesus was born, right, the wise men came. They brought gold and frankincense and, and myrrh. Okay, the, two of those things are byproducts of trees and plants and they're very expensive. One of them was literally incense. It was a thing that was used that was very important. And so to talk about this being incense, it means there's a sweet aroma to God. It's something that's pleasing to Him. It's something that's different. If you walk into a place and they're burning incense, you can smell it and know, right? You, you have a pretty good sniffer and you can distinguish between different kinds of smells. I know you've walked into a place before with, no, oh, I know what they're burning in here, <laughs> right? You, you either do or don't stick around for a long time, depending on your personality there. But you can tell there's something different about this, right? It's not wood fire. It's not a coal fire. This is, you know, happy grass, and we're all going to be happy people after we smoke it, right? You can tell what it is. It's markedly different from the air, everything else around it. There's one thing that smells like that, Okay. The same is true with his incense. Nothing else smells like that incense. It's, it's only used for that. And it's a sweet, pleasing aroma for God. And again, it's a valuable commodity. This, is, this was one of those things where you could be robbed for your little box of incense, and that was worth more than the gold you had sometimes. So when we talk about these wise men making this journey, <laughs> this was not just a light trip. This was a armored convoy because what they were carrying for the king of kings was very valuable. It was used in worship. When we talk about incense, the Old Testament has a lot to say about incense, how it's used and what kind it's used and how it's supposed to be made. It only can be used for this or that. The throne room literally smells of prayer. Think about that. When you walk into the throne room, what's that smell? It's the prayers of the saints. And so I want you to think about it this way. Kind of that, that same sensation you get, if you can imagine. Because I know they, they say that smell is the closest tied to your memory. You ever smell something and for about five seconds you're, you're six years old again at grandma's house? Okay? Think of that. When God smells those prayers, right? His memories. It's like walking into your mama's kitchen. Mm. You can't taste it but it's good for your heart, right? Your heart is full in that moment. When you smell that, I'm home. Why do we do that? Well, because we're made in the image of God, and so when he smells, I'm home. Where's that home? With his children, with the people he created to be with him. And what is that? It's full of incense. Exodus chapter 30, verses 1 through 10. I'm not going to read it all to you. You can look it up. But it details the altar of incense at the tabernacle. And this was not just, hey, I want you guys to build me a table, and I want you to burn some incense on it. 
It was a very specific table made out of specific wood and covered with so much gold and designed a certain way. God was very precise about this table. And he had very specific times that they were supposed to burn the incense. In fact, morning and evening offering. He said, I want Aaron to come and burn this. Every morning he comes in, he starts burning incense. In the evening when he comes in, he starts burning the incense. Why? So incense will burn regularly before the Lord for the generations to come. He said, in front of my temple, and the altar of incense sat in front of everything else. So when you walked into the tabernacle, there was the altar of incense, and then there was the curtain and the holy of holies you know, behind all that. The altar of incense was out here. It's where everybody could come in and see the altar. It wasn't hidden away. And when you walked in, you could smell the incense. And the closer you got to the Holy of Holies, the stronger that smell became. And he said, I want it burning day and night for generations. In Exodus 30, verse 10, I found this beautiful. Once a year, Aaron shall make atonement on its horns. Each of the corners had a, a horn, right? Came off the corner. This annual atonement must be made with the blood of the atoning sin offering for the generations to come. It is most holy to the Lord. On the altar of incense, literally nothing else is to be burned on this giant table except for incense. But once a year, it's covered with blood, symbolizing that the people have repented of their sins and the lamb or the goat has been slain to cover their sins for another year. And it says this incense is the prayers of the saints. Again, I find this so beautiful. Scripture says he inhabits the praise of his people. Inside of these golden bowls, this most valuable substance, is the prayers of the saints. You and I. Literally, saints means holy ones. I looked up the Greek for it. it means, literally, that's the direct translation. The saint is a holy one. Well, in Leviticus 11.45, God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. He didn't call us to be happy. He doesn't call us to be entertained. He doesn't call us to be anything else. He says, be holy. We're commanded to be holy. Why? Because God is holy. What does that mean? It means we're set apart. If the table of incense is holy to the Lord, it means it's set apart. Nothing else can be used for this except for what to glorify the Lord. It's one thing. It's set apart for one thing. Why? To glorify God. And here he's talking about the saints, the prayers of the saints. What does that mean? It means we are the holy ones. It means we have been set apart by the blood of the Lamb for a very specific purpose. It's our prayers in those bowls. So when you pray, I want you, to think, I want you to picture this. When you pray tonight, imagine God sitting on the throne. Oh, my child is praying again. And that sweet incense. They're home. My children are home. Why? Because we're in the presence of God. Oh, I can, I can sit. This is... I was so wrong when I said this wouldn't be a short lesson. I love how the Lord uses it for big things. So now apply everything we said about the incense to our prayers. They're pleasing. <coughs> they're holy. They make God feel good. They're before the throne. They're in the room inside the golden bowls. They're always before the Lord. Well, if you look at 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it says, Pray without ceasing. Always before the Lord. We'll always be in conversation with the Lord. Pray without ceasing. Blood on the altar. Right? Our prayers are that means of salvation. How do I get saved? I pray to God. He hears my prayer. And he saves me. Why? Through the blood of the Lamb. 1 John 1, 9. Confess your sins. The Lord is just. He is faithful. He will forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. 
Well, how do I confess? I have to talk to the one who can forgive me. I have to confess to who? To the Lord. What's we call that? We call that prayer. It is through our prayers that we come to back to our Father. It is through our prayers that we are united. We communicate. And we receive the blood of the Lamb. This, this, is, this is beautiful. I love this. And I could bask all day in this moment. It was hard for me to move on past this. Because I, I really wanted to just camp here for a little bit. I really want you guys, when you pray, I want you to think about the depth of this. The sweetness of this moment. When you pray, it's not just, dear Lord, please help me because I need this. When you pray, you, you are in the throne room with him. Your heart, your voice, the fragrance of your prayers is sweet. If that doesn't give depth to your prayer life, I, I don't know what will. Check your pulse. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on. It says, and they sang a new song. Matthew Henry, one of the commentaries I looked at, says the song of praise that was offered up to the Lamb on this occasion consists of three parts. One part sung by the church, another <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, okay. Another by the church and the angels. I thought I'd messed up there. And the third by every creature. Now, you say, well, preacher, it says the saints and the four <clears throat> creatures, right? The, 12, uh, the 24 saints or elders and the, the creatures. So how does he get church? Now, if you remember back several lessons, we talked about the, the elders, the 24 elders that surrounded the throne. One of the, the views of who these people are are that they are the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 patriarchs, right? the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and the 12 apostles, the new covenant. And around the throne, through Jesus Christ, he has brought them all together. He has fulfilled the laws of the Old Testament. He fulfilled all of that that pointed to the cross. And he also brought in the sheep that are not of this flock. That's you and I, right? And he brought them together that we would have one flock now. So when John sees the 24 elders around the throne, he's seeing the perfect church brought together through the blood of the Lamb. And so that's kind of where Matthew Henry is operating from. That's what these 24 represent. So when he talks about the church, he's talking about this representation, right? They are symbolically representing all of the church because the, 12, the 24 elders are humans. That's you and I. And he says it's a new song. Well, new how? Well, we look at the New Testament. It's the new covenant made through the blood of the Lamb. If you go back to verse 6, John saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. That's why it's the new covenant. Jesus said at the Last Supper, this is the blood of the covenant, the new covenant. In Jeremiah, I believe it was, he said, I'm going to make a new covenant, one that will not be broken. I'm not going to write it on stone. I'm going to write it on something hard. I'm going to put it on their hearts because they keep breaking the last testament that I put on stones. The last covenant I made with them, they keep breaking it. I don't. They do. Humans. They can't keep ten simple rules. But there's going to come a day when I'm going to have a new covenant. And I'm going to not put it on stone. I'm going to put it on their heart because the human heart is infinitely harder than stone. The Old Testament was fulfilled by his perfect sacrifice. If you start in Genesis 1-1, you start the road leading to the cross. That is the apex of human history. Everything leads up to that point. And from that point on, we're just seeing an unraveling of time until the end, whenever that may be. The cross is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament rules and laws and prophecies. And then the empty tomb on Sunday morning. Praise the Lord. So they sing a new song. And he makes the point that prayer should always accompany praise. The two go hand in hand. It's like breathing in and breathing out. You can't do one without the other. You can try, but you can only do it for so long. They're natural partners. They go hand in hand. There, there are things that just they, they just go so well together, you can't imagine having one without the other, right? Like Oreos and milk. 
peanut butter and jelly, coffee and donuts, right? You just go hand in hand. They're just so perfectly matched. Why would you have one without the other? How much more important is prayer and praise? Why would I do one? Why, why would I pray but then never give God thanks for hearing my prayers? Why would I praise if I never talk to God and say, hey, you know, I, I have no reason to praise. If I never talk to him, yeah, well, okay, well, whatever. If, if I never talk to my wife and all of a sudden I say, hey, you're doing a great job. Okay, where'd that come from? Why does that matter? I don't care about your opinion because you never give, you know. It's the communication, they go hand in hand. Prayer and praise. And so let's break down the song a little bit here. The first verse, anyway. It says, you are worthy. You are worthy to what? To do what needs to be done. You already have, right? That's, that's, we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. But you alone are worthy to take the scroll and open the seals. It's an acknowledgement. You alone are worthy to reveal and implement God's plan for humanity. We're rejoicing, we're celebrating, because remember, John was weeping just a few minutes ago because there was no one found in all of creation that was worthy. Nobody. One of the saints came up and said, hey, John, don't cry, buddy. There is someone who is worthy, but he's not in creation. He's here in the throne room. It's Jesus. He alone is worthy. Why? Because you were slain. It's not excluding his divine nature. It's not saying, well, you know, you were fully God and so you could do... No. It's focused on the reasons for their thanksgiving. Lord, you are worthy. Why? Because you were slain. Yes, you are fully God and we respect and we love that. But you came and, and you died for us. You chose to willingly suffer for us. For me. And that's, that's why we're, we're praising you today, because you gave so much. You gave everything for us. And so we're singing. Well, what was the consequence of that action? It purchased men for God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You were bought with a price. Acts chapter 20, verse 28, be shepherds of the church. He's talking to the leaders here. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. We were bought at a price. And it cost God his only son. Now, I love this quote by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. What cost, got much, what cost God much for us cannot be cheap. Grace. It cost God his one and only son. For us, it's not going to be cheap, right? It cost us, what, everything. Remember what I said about praise and worship? I have, to, I have to stop being me. I have to live for him. I have to come to an end so that he can continue living on and be glorified. He purchased men for God. And he said, from every tribe and language. This is the whosoever in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. All right, that's the whosoever from every tribe and nation and language and tongue, right? The world. Everybody. You didn't die just for the Jews. You didn't die just for the Romans or the Gentiles. You died for everybody. So that all could come. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 15, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Why is the lamb in heaven? Well, because he rose again. He didn't stay in the tomb. That's why he's in heaven again. And he died for all. And he says, you are a kingdom. This is a new nation. It's not of this world. We talk about a kingdom. It's different than what we're used to. We as Americans, we kind of we kind of buck at the term kingdom, right? Because we, we don't like kings. We literally fought two wars to break away from one. We're we're fiercely independent. And, and, and people can say what they will about America and freedom, but there there is no place on earth that is as free as America. There are other places that do have some freedom, but not nearly as much. Go just north. To Canada. 
Preachers are being arrested for preaching against homosexuality. They don't have freedom of religion. They don't have freedom of speech. They're just south in New Mexico. You probably get shot by a drug cartel, right? Well, you don't have freedoms there. You're being held prisoner. Try going to England. A lady got arrested for praying silently outside of an abortion clinic. Praying in her head. The thought police literally arrested her and took her to jail because she was praying quietly in her mind. She wasn't saying anything. She was standing there with her hands in her pockets like this. And they arrested her for harassing people. They don't have freedoms like we do. And we, we, we kind of buck at the king thing. Ah, I don't like kings. It didn't say you are a nation here. Literally, I looked up the word. It says kingdom. You, you have made us to be a kingdom. And it's not of this world. It's not like anything that's ever existed on this world except for in the Garden of Eden. We are not led by mankind, not by politics, but as God, not as president, we don't elect him, as king, as sovereign. It is his right to rule, his right to reign. Not us. He alone has that right. We are his subjects, right? Part of the word subjects is sub. It's the same word you find in submission. I become less. I put myself under his authority. Why? Because he is the king. You know, when we broke away from England, it was revolutionary. Canada was the 14th colony. Why, are they, why were they still friends with England? Because they were submissive to the king. They said, you know, we got a good thing going. We don't want to mess it up. We tried to get Canada on board. In fact, in 1812, we tried to reclaim Canada. They're like, no, no, we're, we're good. You guys go. We're going to be servants to the king. That's why England and Canada are so closely tied together still, because they're still submissive people. We as Americans, we don't like that. We, we, mm, we fight against it. Why? Because that's just who we are. It's part of our nature. We, we buck the system. But we have to be understanding that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We have to acknowledge his sovereignty over our lives. And when the king speaks, we have to listen or face the consequences of disobedience, of treason. What's the wages of sin? Death. What's the wages of high treason? Death. Our founding fathers, it was Benjamin Franklin, said we must all stand together or surely we'll all hang separately. Right? They were committing high treason when they signed the Declaration of Independence. What would that lead to? Death. When we sin, we commit treason against the king. What does that lead to? Death. We have to acknowledge, God, you are sovereign. But he is a good God. And he says, you are priests to serve our God. You have made us a kingdom and priests. 1 Peter 2, 5, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What does the priest do? The priest offers sacrifices. Right? When you would bring your, your goat, your lamb, your doves, whatever it was, to the, the uh, temple in Jerusalem, you would go see the priest, and you would give them to the priest, and he would sacrifice the animals for you. The priest offers sacrifices to represent you before God. 1 Peter 2.9, but you are chosen, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. What else does a priest do? They proclaim the message that God has given to them. They offer spiritual sacrifices. Let's look at that a little bit more. Not physical sacrifices for us. Now, sometimes it, it does look like that for us, but... More importantly is the heart. When we declare his praise, we call that evangelism. We tell people about the goodness of God. I, I was listening to one guy, I see him on Facebook pop up every once in a while. He's, he goes to uh, college campuses. And I don't say debates, but he kind of debates with the college kids. And he says, look, I'm not telling you to follow Christianity. I'm telling you to follow Christ. I'm his mailman. I didn't write this stuff. I didn't make it up. 
I'm telling you what God said in his holy book. I'm just God's mailman. Right? We declare the goodness of God. That's what the priest does. He offers sacrifices and he tells people about God. Well, what's prayer? We've already covered prayer. That's the incense offering. When we confess, the blood offering is applied. When we praise, that's the free will offering. When we give tithes, that's the monetary offering. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in light of God's mercy, to present yourselves, your bodies, as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your acceptable act of worship. Therefore, do not be conformed to this world any longer, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Then you'll be able to test what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. We need to surrender ourselves to God. Right? That's the sacrifice the holy spiritual sacrifice. I surrender to God. And I allow him to transform me. To make me what? A new creation. Talk about the transforming of our minds. What we think pops out of our mouths. Right? This is kind of the core of, of, of how we identify ourselves. When I talk to you, I don't talk to your body. I talk to your mind. Well, what is that? I don't know. I can't see it. I assume that it's there. But that's who I'm having a conversation with. I'm not talking to your body. I'm talking to you. Here. And I have to allow him to transform who I am. Change who Joshua Householder is. And make me into his image. Not in the image of the world. And he says, they will reign on the earth. And you know, in the commentaries I read, they were surprisingly quiet on this little phrase. What does it mean? They will reign on the earth. Matthew Henry said this, they shall with him judge the world at the great day. So at the end of human history, we will be on the throne with Christ, is how Matthew Henry sees it. So when the judgment is given, the church will be with him sitting in judgment on the world. We'll go back to Revelation chapter 2. Now this is the letter to the church in Thessalonica, or Thyatira. The one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received my authority from my Father. Revelation 3.23 <laughs> He's speaking to the church in Laodicea. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. If we look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 through 13, Paul writes, Here's a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, well, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. That's just who he is. He is faithful. But there is an aspect of the church reigning with Christ if we endure and overcome. What? Life. Whatever obstacles life throws at us, we persevere, we push through, we overcome, we endure through the power of God, right? the power of the Spirit who leads us, we follow him. Not of our strength, not in... Whatever earthly strength we find, this is not might makes right. This is wisdom. Right? Work smarter, not harder. Choose to follow God the first time and it will be a lot easier. We need to overcome, persevere, and endure. And we will reign. What does that look like? I don't know. I'll tell you when we get there. <laughs> Folks, when people ask you something about the Bible and you don't know, it is perfectly acceptable to say, I don't know. None of us have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. And it is fine to say, look, I, I don't know. But I know the one who does, and I can pray, and I can study. And when he reveals it to me, I'll let you know. What does it look like for us to reign with Christ? For me to even speculate would be to miss the mark. I don't know what that looks like. I'll, I'll tell you when we get there. But I do know what it says. It says we will reign with Christ. 
And I believe, I can kind of surmise my limited mental capacity, that it means we will be with him, we will reign with him, and he will give us authority and power. We kind of need those things to reign. Again, what does that look like? I don't know. Okay? But that's why we're still talking about Revelation 2,000 years later. Because there's still things that we're learning. And again, I've read through this a lot. This is not one of those things that has clicked yet. When it does, I'll let you know. All right? So let's move on. We're, we're, getting, we're coming in towards the end, and I, we are moving along. I had 21 uh, slides on this, and I was afraid we weren't going to get to the end, but it looks like we may actually even get there a minute or two early. There's a second verse to this worship. Let's read ahead here. Uh, down through verse 12. This is 10, 11, and 12. You have made them... Oh, sorry, 11 and 12. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. So the second verse of this worship song as many angels. Literally, he writes here, thousands upon thousands, ten times, ten thousands times ten thousands. Now, does that mean that John counted every angel? No, he said there's lots of angels. <laughs> That's what John is saying. There's more than I can count. This was like what a kid tells you a bajillion. Okay, it's just a big number. This is how they would express that. Thousand times upon a thousand, ten thousand times ten thousand. They're much more eloquent than we are today. What John is saying is there were so many angels, I couldn't even begin to count them. You ever, you ever anybody ever been out west, out through the plains country? And, and this, this for me is something as, as a as a poor mountain kid. I don't get experience much. But when you can just look. As far as the eye can see, and you can't really focus on the horizon because it's so far away. It's just kind of a fuzzy line out there where heaven and earth meet somewhere in the distance. And you can look this way, and you can see as far as you could possibly see, and look as far in front of you, as behind, and, and you feel about this big. It, there's, a, there's a sensation that I can't explain to you. This would be like John trying to explain the prairies to me unless I'd been there. I, I have no frame of reference. Coming from the mountains, if I can see a mile, I'm doing pretty good. Out there, if you can see for 20 miles, that's average. My dad and I, we were driving along, we'd say, how far is that water tower? And we would guess, 5 miles, 12 miles, 30 miles later, we'd pass the water tower, right? It's, but that's kind of what John is experiencing. As far as he can see in any direction surrounding the throne are legions of angels. And he, I mean, I mean, just imagine, he already feels this big, and now he looks out, and man, heaven just got a lot bigger. All of these thin, tens upon tens upon tens of thousands of angels surrounding the throne. I find comfort in knowing, no matter how big the enemy may seem at the time, God and his armies are greater. Satan is one angel. Now, let's not get that confused and say that he's a pushover, right? He, he was the best of the best. Which is why he got prideful. But he's one angel. Even with all the fallen angels that followed him, John looks at it and sees hundreds of thousands of angels surrounding the throne. No matter how big the enemy may say he is, he's nothing compared to our God. Nothing. They surrounded the throne and everyone else in the throne room, the 24 elders and the four living creatures, surrounded which tells me something you're not getting to God unless he wants you to be there you're not getting to God unless he wants you to be there you're not getting into the throne room unless you're invited and yet where do we find our prayers right in front of the throne that's about as close as you could get without actually being on the throne why because he wants us there he wants us in his presence he wants us in the throne room with him that's why we were created. He loves us. 
And we could be far, far, far away out in the crowd somewhere. He says, no, no, I want you here in the throne room with me. This is where I want you to be. And he says they said in a loud voice. They sang in a loud voice. Well, they're messengers. Remember the word angel, angloss, literally means messenger. We talked about your postman, right? Your mailman, your mail carrier professional. We're using a politically correct term, right? They're angels. They're messengers. They bring a message from someone else to you. They're angloss. Okay, these angels, this is what they're created for. They fight and they carry messages. That's the two jobs we see of angels in Scripture. They fight and they carry messages. And so they use their voice to proclaim in a loud voice. So the context of their song here. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. It's not so much about what Jesus did for humanity because they don't understand grace, right? They, they've not fallen from grace. They never needed grace. And they're not human beings, okay? The angels are not people who have died and gone to heaven. That's two different categories. Okay, that's like saying when my dog dies, he goes to heaven and becomes a cat. No, that's not how that happens, okay? When people die, we don't become angels. I assure you, you're not that much of an angel here on earth either, all right? When you go to heaven, you're not going to be an angel either. It's two different groups, apples and oranges. Okay? They're created beings by God, but they're not humans. They are their own thing. So they don't understand why we're singing about you were slain with the blood, you purchased men. That's the elders singing because they understand the cost. They understand, Jesus, you died for us. The angels... They're not singing that part. They join with humanity and they praise. But they sing about his worthiness and his merits. It's a little different for them. They proclaim facts about Jesus, not emotional thoughts. Right? When the church sings about the blood of the Lamb, I get a little emotional. Why? Because I know what that, what that means for me. We sing about the old rugged cross, I get a little teary-eyed. Why? Because I know what the old rugged cross means the angels don't they're just proclaiming the facts what are the facts worthy is the lamb who was slain this is who he is and, and this is what he did he was slain he's worthy why to receive power honor wealth wisdom strength honor and glory and praise that's just a fact they're just being messengers they're proclaiming in a loud voice who he is and what he deserves that's what they do they bring the message that God has given to them what's the message in this case it's here Messengers bear the truth. If not, they're, they're bad messengers. Right? We call those people liars. And there are no liars in heaven. Only people who tell the truth, right? There's only truthfulness before the throne. If they were bad angels and started lying, well, they were kicked out with Satan. <laughs> that, that purge has already happened. So if they're here in the throne room, that means that they're trustworthy and they're bearing the truth. Think Gabriel, Mary, don't be afraid. You're going to have a son. All right? Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. She's going to have a son. It's from God. Hey, shepherds, got a message for you. Go over here to Bethlehem. You're going to find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. They bring a truthful message. That's what they do. <clears throat> they bear the truth. And then we come to the third verse. Verse 13. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Brings us to the end of the chapter. So we get to the third verse of this praise song. And it says, every creature. Now, what does that mean? It means every creature. In heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and on the sea, and in the seas. Did I miss anything? No, that's literally every creature, all of creation, enters the third verse of praise. 
Now remember, we just talked about this on Sunday. The Pharisees scolded Jesus and said, hey, tell your disciples to shut up. And they said, if they be quiet, the rocks and the trees are going to cry out and praise, right? Every living creature on the earth and under the earth and everywhere cries out in their own voice. This is how in Romans 12, or Romans chapter 1, Paul could say, we are without excuse. Why? Because we have creation to show us that God exists. You may not be able to recite the full chapters of John, but you can look at the heavens above and the trees and the birds and the skies and go, there's something bigger than just us out here. This wasn't an accident. There's an intelligent mind behind this. All of creation cries out. I want to read to you here Psalm 96. I love this. Now remember, this was written 1,000, 1,500 years or so before John. I'm not sure. Bob, uh, do you remember how far David was before Jesus? 1,000 years. 1,000 years. Okay, so this was 1,100 years, give or take, before John wrote Revelation. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. That sounds like a summary of what we've talked about today. We see the royal priesthood. We see bringing sacrifices. We see fear and trembling in the Lord's presence. We see all creation worshiping. 1,100 years before John writes this, David saw it. And now here we have John saying, I've seen it too. And this is what it looks like, exactly like that. It's beautiful. It says, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, we praise the one, we glorify the other. All right, the three are one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now are distinct. And yet they are the same. How does it work? I don't know. I'll tell you when I get there. Right? Go back to Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. He gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All of creation cries out. The four living creatures say amen. And they're not, not, I'm not saying they're bringing this to a close, but they're kind of closing out this section. When they say amen, it means so be it. Right? So be it. What they've said, glory, honor, praise forever and ever. Amen. This is truth. Let it be so. And the worship continues. How long? For eternity. That's why we're here and that's why we're going to be there. All right, last slide. Chapter 4, 5, review. Now, we have an interesting order that I've seen in chapters 4 and 5. God reveals himself. We see Jesus. Jesus does what he came to do, right? He does his job. He does what he's supposed to do. Worship breaks out because Jesus did what he was supposed to do with prayers and praise. Then the book is opened. Now, when I read that, I see our worship service on Sunday morning. We pray, God, reveal yourself to us as we come to worship. We be here in this place. We come, we see Jesus. Jesus does what he's supposed to do, right? He came, he died, he rose again. We celebrate, we worship. 
Worship breaks out in response. That's why we worship on Sunday instead of Saturday. Every Sunday is commemorating Easter. When he rose from the dead, he fulfilled that promise. Worship breaks out. We praise, we pray, and we open the book. Now, this book that opens up in chapter 6 goes a little different than what we do on Sunday mornings. This is where we get the fire and brimstone kind of preaching from. But what we do here on earth is a reflection of what happens in heaven. Right? It's kind of like what Paul says. I see dimly now as if in a, in a, in a cheap mirror, right? polished piece of metal, like a funhouse mirror. I can kind of see a little bit, but someday I'll be on the other side of the veil. I'll, I'll be able to see clearly. But now I'm just kind of getting a little bit of a, somewhat of a picture. The book is open. We're going to get that next week. It transitions our focus from the church on earth, the letters, to God in heaven. And it sets the stage for the seals to be broken, the trumpets to blast, and plagues to be poured out. That sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it? So we're going to get to that next week. We're going to, well, not next week. Next week we will not meet because it is um, uh, spring break. So the kids will be gone. Uh, so we will not meet next week. I mean, you're welcome to come sit in the parking lot, but we won't be here to let you into the church, okay? Uh, that being said, make sure you read. Go back and read the first five chapters and read the rest of Revelation 2. You've got a whole week. Take a chapter a day, or two chapters a day, and you'll get pretty far. <clears throat> Let me pray with us, and then we'll get out of here. Father God, I thank you again for your word. I thank you that we, as we pray even now, our prayers rise before you like a sweet incense. I thank you for your love that draws us near. I thank you for your son who died to save us, and I thank you for the spirit that lives within us now. It sets us apart and makes us holy and draws us close to you, Father. Lord, as, as we go from here, I pray for your safety upon us. I pray, Lord, that you will bring us together again soon. And as we prepare our hearts for Easter Sunday morning, Lord, that you will truly, truly come alive within our hearts today. Father God, may this be a, an outpouring, a season of outpouring of the Spirit in such a way that we've never experienced before. Lord, I pray for those fires of revival to be rekindled within our hearts that we may burn brightly for you. Lord, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you all. God bless. You are dismissed. I'll see you in class in two weeks. I'll see you Sunday.